your idea of fun is being scared to death, working on a project that you don't know if it's going to work, you're not quite sure if you'll hit the deadline, if you lie awake at night thinking about it because you're not quite certain whether you did exactly the right thing before you left work and maybe you should get up and check it online, if your idea of a really good time is coming up with an idea that's yours and you know you have some opportunity to do it, but you've got all this other stuff to do, but on the other hand, you can't not do it, and you know other people will help you, and you know you don't need to do it, but you would really kind of like to do it, and you know that if you do do it, people will really love it if it really works, then I really do advise you to come and work here. But if you want guarantees, yes, of course, we'll have an IPO and we'll all be millionaires. If you want guarantees, you know, there's a smooth career path, and if you jump through this hoop, you'll be promoted, and if you get jump through that ho hoop, you'll get a bonus. If that's the sort of place that you want, that you want then please go away. <laughs> that's what my husband called my Green Beret speech. And I used to use it when I was interviewing job candidates when I was running tech companies in the US. And it was almost invariably in response to a question from someone sitting across the table at me who would say, so what guarantee can you give me that you'll be in business five years from now? And the answer was absolutely none. Nobody can. I don't know if BP is going to be in business five years from now. We've seen companies come and go, and sometimes they go because they've been turned into something else through acquisition, and sometimes they go because it turns out they were you know, not quite what they should have been, and sometimes they go because they were startups based on a good idea that nobody else really understood. Companies go and come and go all the time. There are no guarantees in work at the moment. I mean, just ask people in the in, you know, who are MPs. Definitely no guarantees in the cabinet, right? So, but the reason I did this, which was, you know, let's face it, at the time, in a very overheated job market, it was a pretty eccentric mode of recruiting. But I did it because I didn't want to hire people who were going to sit at their desks all day dreaming of retiring at the age of 40 and playing golf for the rest of their lives. I didn't want to hire people who wanted a kind of steady as you go, just put in, exact, do exactly what people tell you kind of workforce. I didn't want people who wanted to be told exactly what to do, how to do it, and when to do it, because that meant they wouldn't know any more than I did, in which case we would really be in trouble. I wanted people who were ambitious, who had real drive, who had ideas of their own that they were longing to express, and who wanted to contribute those to the work that we were trying to do. And if I could hire people like that, I had a pretty high level of confidence that wherever we ended up, we would end up in a really good place. Now, since then, I've spent a lot of time visiting companies and organizations around the world. And I've come to see that actually, although perhaps my style of recruiting was personally a little idiosyncratic, Actually, what I was looking for and what I was trying to articulate was really not so strange after all. We live in an age of uncertainty where we don't exactly know what's going to happen to the workforce. We have all these fantastic projections and forecasts about automation and you know, 38% of jobs disappearing or 25% of jobs disappearing or more jobs being created than being destroyed. And, you know, when you plow through all of those, as I have done, I can tell you nobody has the faintest idea. Okay. So what we, but what we do know is that work is going always to be full of uncertainty. Every innovation is uncertain. It doesn't start with guarantees. We're going always to work in places that are full of ambiguity, where it's not quite clear where the market's going or what people want. Anytime we're doing innovation, ambiguity and uncertainty are there. And we live in an age where we don't know what's going to happen to the economy. We don't know what's going to happen in Brexit. We have no idea, except that we're going to find ways of keeping going, because that's what human beings do. 
And when I visit lots of workplaces that I think are really exceptional and show me a lot of the capabilities that we need today and for the future, I see them full of places, full of people that are fine with this. So one of the places I visited, I guess about a year ago, was CERN, where the Large Hadron Collider is, where they finally, finally found the Higgs boson. Now, science is a very, very competitive field. There are, there's a huge oversupply of PhDs, and science is typically quite poorly paid. And yet, people beg to go and work at CERN. Why? Well, one reason is because they know that the work being done there is exceptionally challenging and difficult. They know that if they get the opportunity to work there, they're going to try to prove things that may or may not be true. Nobody knew if the Higgs boson existed. It was a great theory. Was it true? I met a whole bunch of scientists who've been spending their lifetime working on a theory called supersymmetry. It's a nice theory, they tell me. I don't even begin to understand it. Right? It's a nice theory. It should be true. But so far, for all their experiments, they can neither prove that it's true or that it's false. But it's exciting to look and to find ingenious ways to try to find out. Another project at CERN is called DUNE. It's a search for a particular kind of neutrino. And this particular kind of neutrino might exist, or it might not. They don't know. And they're building what will become, after the Large Hadron Collider, the biggest piece of machinery in the world. I can't tell you how proud people are to be involved in this project. Some of the scientists I was talking to about it, by the time the experiments actually take place using it, they'll be retired. They don't care. They're part of something great. Every single person I talked to who works on this project told me, well, you know, we're using liquid argon in this, and that was the idea of Carlo Rubia. Carlo Rubia won the Nobel Prize for physics because he discovered the W and the Z boson. I've never heard people talk with such pride because they know that they stand on the shoulders of giants. They know that they might not find anything. They know they might find something. They know that the work is ambiguous because nobody in the world has the faintest idea how to do this work, but they get a chance to try, and that's enough for them. The work has meaning. It's part of something that has meaning in the world. Now, I have found exactly the same characteristics at what you might consider to be the opposite end of the scale, which is in the NHS. The people who work in the NHS, God bless them, they are abused and insulted in the press every day. Ministers play mayhem with their jobs and with their institutions and their structures, and this is a football everybody likes to kick around. But in the day-to-day -day existence of working in the NHS, people know that their work really matters. They know that patients matter. They know that patients' families matter. They know that the communities that they serve really matters. And so despite the abuse that they get and the long hours that they have and the terrible working environments that they routinely are stuck in, they turn up because they know that what they're doing is important. They know that it has to be done and they know that it makes a huge difference to the lives that they touch. I've seen exactly the same thing in a firm called Arup. Arup is a construction and engineering company. And they have a sort of strategy, if you could call it that, which is they mostly want to work on buildings that matter. And so every time an architect comes up with some completely insane building requiring a use of materials and engineering that nobody's ever figured out how to do, Arup is the only construction firm anybody will ever turn to. 
They built the Pompidou Center. They s built the Sydney Opera House. They built the Wobbly Bridge across to the Tate, and they fixed it. And they've built most of the insane buildings for London 2012 and Beijing in 2008. All of these required fanatically difficult problems to be solved. They're the only firm in the world that is capable of finishing the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. And the engineers that work at Arup do so not because they're wildly overpaid, because actually they're, they do grumble a little bit because they're underpaid. But the thing is, you can't get them to retire, right? They love the work. They love the problems. They love the work because it's hard, not because it's easy. They love the work because it's risky, not because it's safe. And I think this is important for us to remember because you know, we've, well, there's a whole kind of ethos of saying, oh, no, no, it'll all be fine. It'll be safe. It'll be easy. It'll be fun. I can remember hearing managers saying this to their teams and thinking, why? Why say this when you know the work's going to be hard? If you say a huge project is going to be easy and fun, and then it turns out quite predictably to be bloody difficult and excruciatingly stressful, Everybody thinks they must have screwed up. Whereas if you say at the very beginning, this is going to be one of the toughest things you've ever done. It's going to stretch you and challenge you to beyond what you think you're capable of doing. Then when it is hard, those people will think, ah, oh, this is exactly what they told us it would be. No need to panic. If we're terrified and scared to death, we are right on schedule. Right? And then when they finish it, they can have a real sense of achievement. Now, some of this has become what we've started to think about as purpose. Purpose is the buzzword these days. I'm not quite sure how purpose differs from mission and values and all that jazz that we've all lived through. But what I do know is that it really has to mean something. I saw one of the purpose statements I looked up recently is helping Britain prosper. I have no idea what that means. I don't know if these people make pharmaceuticals or um, illicit drugs or make music or dentistry. I haven't the faintest idea how Britain is prospering due to this company. Do they make money or sell money or give money away? Or do they make vegan sausage rolls? I have no idea. Right? So the danger of all this kind of purpose mumbo jumbo is it's kind of like putting a huge layer of icing on top, top of a dry old cake to try to give the impression that it's really moist. If the work itself doesn't have meaning, slathering a purpose statement on top of it won't really do the job. It has to be intrinsic, organic, and real. Now, if you, if you work in companies, and God, I hope you don't, but people do. If you work in companies where the product is kind of toxic or rubbish, or the service is kind of shabby, then you can definitely recruit people and tell them exactly what to do and give them bonuses when they do it. And they'll stay. They'll come, and they'll stay. And they'll do exactly what you told them to do. But they won't do anything else. They won't go the extra mile. They won't have ideas. They'll just do what they've been told to do and no more. Well, wouldn't you? If you can't be proud of the work, if the, if the work doesn't have intrinsic meaning, why should you go the extra mile? How much nicer to get home on time and be able to see your kids or go play tennis or, God forbid, even golf? Who knows? Right? There are so many dead ends on the road to motivation. One of them, of course, is money. 
And money is a motivator. Let's be really clear about that. People who say money doesn't motivate people, try them, right? Just try them, right? Of course, it motivates people. You can do funky experiments, you know, and ask people to hang from the monkey bars. And amazingly, if you offer them a lot of money, they hang up there longer, right? Money will help people endure pain. It's not my idea of brilliant management strategy, but, you know, it works up to a point when they need more and more and more and more because you've now stuck them on the hedonic treadmill. And all you really are doing is encouraging them to spend, or encouraging them to spend which means now you have to pay them more and more and more just to turn up. But there are also some very specific ways in which mo money motivates people, which is not really great. And there's a whole kind of encyclopedia of really deeply funky experiments that, experiment, uh, that uh, demonstrate this. But I'll just tell you about one. So it's an experiment in which people are brought in to play Monopoly, and there's a great deal of emphasis on who's making the most money, who's making the most money. And then at the end of the experiment, because the Monopoly game is just a kind of distraction, it's just to get money on their minds. And as they come out of the game-playing session and they cross the office, one of the experiment teams walks across their path with a box of pencils and sort of deliberately by accident, drops the pencils. And what's really interesting is the groups who've been playing Monopoly will walk on by. But the, the control group that's just been sitting around talking to each other, they will rush to help. And what this and other experiments demonstrate is that the more you think about money, the more you don't think about other people. And in organizations where collaboration is important, which is just about every organization I've ever seen, that really matters. Do you want people thinking about themselves? Or do you want people thinking about each other and being helpful? Another dead end to motivation has been competition. For a long time, and this is still true in many organizations, there was a belief that if you could just get people to compete with each other, then the best would rise to the top. Everybody would energize each other as they competed fiercely for recognition and rewards and all that sort of stuff. If any of you have seen what's now known as my super chicken talk, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Right? A kind of ethos in which people have to fight for their spot. And the way this mostly manifests in organizations is through forced ranking, right? This fantastic idea that you assess everybody every six or 12 months, and then you put them on a bell curve, and you kick out the bottom 5%, and you award the top 5 or 10%, the high potentials, because obviously the rest have no potential, the high potentials with all sorts of, you know, cool thing titles and programs and so on and so forth. And of course, you don't have to be a mathematician to figure out that in this bell curve, absolutely the safest place to be is in the big, fat middle. Be really average. Because the bottom end of the tail, obviously that's a scary place to be because you're going to get fired. But it turns out the top end is really dangerous too because if you don't really keep fighting for your spot, someone else might come along and knock you down. So you don't want to help anybody, because after all, if I help you, you might go up the scale and I fall out, and suddenly I'm nowhere. So that's where you find cultures in which people hoard information, information's power. I could help you, but I, that might mean that you get better than I am, and I don't want you to be better than I am, so I won't help you. I won't give you the contact with a particular piece of information that you might need, and I might even, as I've discovered in some advertising companies, I might actually go in and deliberately spoil your work. Mm, I'm motivated, but not quite this way that everybody wants me to be. Or I can think of a tech company which went out specifically to hire people with a high risk profile because they thought that's associated with innovation. So let's get people who are daring. But somehow when they hired those people and they came in and they brought them into this system, they lost all their nerve. Because hey, it's much, much easier 
to be really average. Now, this system was proselytized, of course, famously around the world by GE. And I did some work with GE a few years ago. And I said, you know, I'm really interested that you invented this, but I'm much more interested now that you've given up on it, quietly, without really any telling anybody. Why did you give up on it? Well, they said, we finally got around to crunching the data. And what we discovered over 20 years was that it didn't motivate anybody. They all just clung to their spot in the ranking. And people, their whole careers didn't move. So the idea that competition or money is going to motivate people to do the kind of difficult, risky, imaginative, creative work that you want, I think it's a busted flush. I think people want to do work that has meaning. And I think that part of what gives that work meaning is the other people that they work with. Now, I spend a lot of time talking to scientists because scientists, um, well, partly because my husband's a scientist, and I'm always trying to figure out how his mind works. Uh, and, I, and I'm sure one day I will understand. But in the meantime, I talk to scientists because scientists do what entrepreneurs do and what business leaders do, which is they look for hard problems to solve, and then they try to they have a go at it. So they're doing innovation of a very particular kind. And one of the most interesting scientists I encountered was a guy named Uri Alon. Uri works at the Weizmann Institute, doing science I do not understand that lies somewhere on the boundaries between physics and biology. But the thing that Uri is most famous for, apart from you know, all his breakthroughs, which are numerous, is one article he wrote called How to Run a Motivated Team. And what Uri said, I think, has real meaning for all of us. He said when he was a PhD student, he had you know, carved out his subject matter, and he started doing the research, and it got really difficult and squirrely and confusing. And he lost his way completely. He said it was like being knocked over by a wave, and you didn't know if you were upside down or right side up. And he really started to lose his confidence and his sense of competence. And there were some days he said he just couldn't get out of bed in the morning. And eventually he got through and published his PhD and went on to run this very, very productive lab. And he looked back and he thought, what got me through that? How did I get through that? And he realized that what it got it th God had got him through was other people. Other people who helped him. Other people who noticed what a mess he was in. Other people who cared about him. And so now that he runs his own lab, he says he does something that is unusual. He has a, science, a lab meeting every week. Everybody does that. Two hours usually. For some reason on a Tuesday. I don't know why. But the first half hour in Uri's meetings, nobody's allowed to talk about science. Now, scientists don't like talking about anything except science. You know, I regularly have to interview my husband about what he's done in the day, because if he's not going to talk to me about science, then there's nothing to talk about ostensibly. But the first half hour in Uri's meetings, you can talk about theater, or opera, or football, or politics, or your kids, or birthdays, or holidays, or whatever you want, but not about science. And there's a reason, because what Uri says is that that's how all the very competitive scientists in his lab get to know each other as people. And that's why, when they get stuck, and they will always get stuck if they're trying to do something daring and new, that's why they help each other. Because they were helped, and because they understand what it's like, and they've stopped seeing each other as rivals and scientists, and they've started to see each other as human beings. Now, there's quite a lot of academic research that shows that this matters, too, just in case you didn't believe it just because it makes sense, right? And now, the academic research says is really interesting. It's research into collective intelligence, right? The whole premise of organizational life 
is that we come together in organizations because groups of people can solve harder problems better than individuals working alone. But I'm sure every single one of you here today has had the experience of working in a team where exactly the opposite of that seemed to happen where nobody could really get along, nobody really shared information, where there was a lot of bickering and a lot of friction and not a lot of production. So Tom Malone at the Center for Collective Intelligence wanted to understand what's the difference between the really motivated productive teams and the, re and the teams that just go nowhere. So he brought in hundreds of people and he measured their IQ and he gave them hard problems to solve and he found, which was no surprise to anybody, there's a rough correlation between IQ and problem solving. But then he put them into teams and gave them high order design problems to solve. And then he examined why some teams were great and some were completely useless. The first thing that was really interesting about the research is what didn't happen. The high achieving teams were not the teams with the highest aggregate IQ. So the idea that what we want to do in organizations is hire all the brightest, high-achieving, A-star, double-first people in the world and put them together, not justified. Secondly, the great teams were not the teams where they had one or two IQ superstars, the idea being that they'd kind of lift up the rest. Also not proven. The great team, so they had more ways of solving the problems faster, had just three things in common. The first was that they tended to score very highly on a test called reading the mind in the eye test. It's roughly considered a test for empathy. It means how connected are people to each other. One reason I never use slides is I want to look at people's faces. I want to see, are they nodding off? Are they really interested? If they're interested, should I linger on this point a little bit longer? I want them to feel that I'm talking to them, and I can only know that if they're looking at me and not looking at the slides. So empathy is a big deal in communication and in collaboration. The second thing they found is when they rewound and replayed the um, solution discussions, they found that in the high achieving teams, everybody contributed roughly equally. So this wasn't that everybody gets five minutes. It wasn't a formal thing. It just turned out that way. So what they were doing is they were getting a full contribution from every single participant in the room. And the third thing they found, which they were definitely not looking for, but they couldn't escape noticing, was that the high achieving teams had more women in them. <sighs> Now, nobody really knows what this means. Is it an element of diversity? Women score more highly on reading the mind in the eye test. Maybe you're doubling down on empathy. But actually, the heart of the matter here is that what really makes the difference in these high achieving teams is what's happening between people. Now, I think that's really interesting. It suggests that actually what matters isn't the, isn't the bricks, but the mortar. And in recruitment, we mostly have focused on bricks. And of course, now we're starting to think increasingly about mortar, about culture, about how people relate to each other. And again, you know, I like to take this academic research and start going out in the real world and saying, well, does it hold up? And it's really interesting. I mean, it clearly is exactly what Orion happened across through a completely different route. I can also look at organizations like Arab where they say actually their ability to do these impossible things is really down to one thing, which is they have a culture of helpfulness. What does that mean? I said, I don't get it. It sounds a bit boy, girl, scout to me, frankly. And they said, well, the thing is if you're helpful, information flows really, really fast. People don't get stuck. Give me an example, I said. Well, they were building the uh, equestrian center in Beijing for 2008. 
And an engineer was given a very tricky problem, which was how much waste did this building have to cater for? They had 1,200 thoroughbred horses coming from all over the world, some by plane, some by boat, all of them jet lagged and probably pretty pissed off with the travel catering, right? And so they'd come to the equestrian center, and then what would happen to their bodies? Now, this isn't the kind of thing they teach you in engineering school, and it isn't the sort of thing that you want to get wrong, right? You over-engineer the problem, it's too expensive. You under-engineer the problem, well, you can imagine, right? So we sit in there thinking, okay, I could build a spreadsheet model, you know, what they've eaten, uh, the time that it takes horses to digest food, uh, what comes out the other end, uh, how long it takes, all this sort of thing. But even doing that with really rigorous questioning of trainers and vets and all this jazz, he'd still not know if his answer was right. So this is a very uncomfortable place to be. So he's sitting there looking a little anxious, and one of his colleagues comes along and says, what's the problem? You look worried. And he explains the problem. He says, don't worry, I can help you. And in less than 24 hours, he can give the engineer the formula to figure this out. Because he has a friend who once built the jockey club in New York and solved it in real life. That, he said, is the power of helpfulness. It means people don't hoard information, they share information. That means everybody gets much smarter. Getting much smarter, learning stuff, is fantastically motivating. But it's also incredibly effective for getting really difficult things done with high levels of confidence that the building won't fall over and neither will it be mired in piles of whatever. Helpfulness is one of the most decisive distinguishing characteristics of highly productive workplaces. It sounds super anemic, but it's incredibly powerful. I work with one CEO who every year runs a thing that she calls a love week. It sounds maybe a little funky, but what they do once a year is they have a whole week where people get a sort of secret observer who has to notice all the smart, clever, helpful, useful, creative things they do and find secret ways of communicating to them how important and helpful it has been. Everybody loves it. They plan for months ahead cool ways of doing it. But this is a tech company, so they measure everything that moves. And what the CEO told me is this is the one thing where you can see an immediate increase in productivity. In my own companies, you know, all those Green Berets who amazingly did come and work for me, right? We did two things. The first was after I'd hired them, I realized, well, these were really, really deeply motivated people, but they would come in every day and work like crazy and eat in front of their computers and then eventually be sent home, which kind of looks good, but for my money, it was too quiet. It was just too quiet. There was a lot of work going on, but nobody was really working together. So desperate, I said, well, okay, Let's, on Friday afternoons, down tools at 4.30, and every week three people are going to stand up and tell us who they are and why they're here. Because I knew all these people had fantastic backstories and amazing adventures, but lots of other people who hadn't interviewed them didn't know. So we did this, you know, every Friday, and I cannot describe to you how excruciating it was. <laughs> Of course I had to do it, because you can't ask people to embarrass themselves in front of all of their colleagues without doing it yourself. But it was kind of equal opportunity excruciation, right? The engineers mostly did PowerPoints. The marketing people did stand-up comedy, right? But over time, everybody started to see each other as people. And then you started to see people actually having lunch together in the lunchroom or going out together to go to the pub or to the, you know, to the movies or something. They started to see each other as people. And when eventually we came at one point to have to reposition the entire business in 90 days, 
we got it done because people were kind of psyched by the idea of doing something impossible with people whom they now really respected and trusted and who they kind of wanted to prove how good they were to each other. They drove each other to kind of higher and higher levels of excellence. Just yesterday, I was interviewing a young man whose career I've been watching sort of from afar. He started his career as a um, sales engineer, which sounds pretty lowly, because it was pretty lowly. And he's now one of the highest performers in the company after three years. And I said, what is it you know, about this company that has allowed all that to happen? And he said, well, you know, I know what needs to be done, and I'm really good at figuring out how to do things. So we're working with a lot of technology I wasn't very familiar with, but I'm good at learning stuff. And then I kept noticing that there was a lot of things in our processes that were kind of tortuous and repetitive. So I figured out how to automate all of those things. And that made the work easier, and that made everybody more productive. And that also meant I had to go and talk to lots of other people. So I'm a really good cross-pollinator. So this is a guy who actually has found in his organization a great deal of autonomy in terms of how, what he, how he works, what he works on, where he works on it. It's very striking to me, a steel case piece of data I read the other day, 51% of people say they would change their jobs for more flexibility. Now, flexibility is typically interpreted as to do with commuting travel times and kids. I think that's a piece of the, pro of the puzzle. I don't think it's the whole piece. I think flexibility is about autonomy. How, when I work, how I get the work done, having freedom to choose some of those things. And the reason that matters so much is that when I choose where I do it and when I do it, and who kind of have a sense of who I'm doing it with and for, then the work's mine. It's not just a task I've been given, it's mine. And when I volunteer for things or I come up with ideas, that's mine too. And when I care about the people around me, I care about giving them products or devices or applications that really work and save them work, or that allow them to respect me, that make them proud to work there, and that allow them to do the best work that they can do while I do the best work that I can do. Learning and freedom are a huge, huge, source of motivation, and they never wear out. The other huge source of motivation, in my experience, is justice. Now, this isn't about everybody being paid the same. Of course, everybody understands people get paid different rates for different jobs, different skills, and so on and so on. But justice means that everybody matters. I want to do work that's meaningful. I want to do work that matters. I want to do it with people that matter. And I want to feel that I work in a place where everyone matters, not just some people, not just the people on the top floor, not just the people who are executives or have particular titles. I want to be in a place where I feel everyone matters because actually to do my job requires that everybody else do their job. And if they feel they don't matter, they're not going to do their job as well as I would like to do mine. Now, one of the most beautiful examples I ever saw of this was when I interviewed Maureen Beals, who runs National Van Lines. It's a gigantic company in the United States, and they run trucks everywhere, moving people's houses and offices and all sorts of stuff, even, I think, kind of NASA uh, rockets and so on. So this is a huge, huge company in a very disaggregated industry. And she told me a story one day about a driver that she had in Texas. And the driver had fallen off a ladder when he was doing some repairs to his house. And she had heard about this, and she thought about it. And she thought, but hang on a second, a few years ago, his wife died. And he had a young daughter. 
and he's now in the hospital, and I'll bet there's nobody with the daughter. So what we need to do here is we need to get in touch with his older daughter and give her a plane ticket to get to the house to look after the younger daughter. That is a legendary story in this company because it shows that Maureen Beals, who'd never met this guy, still knew that he mattered. At Cisco, John Chambers, when he was CEO, asked for information every week about any employee who was in hospital. Now, he did that for two reasons. One is he was a very early uh, believer in monitoring the wellness of his workforce. So he wanted to know, you know, do we have a lot of people in hospital, and if so, why? But the other thing is he would look at the list and he would write handwritten notes to every single one of them. These are such small things. They're incredibly small things. They take almost no effort or time, but they are hugely articulate of the idea that everyone matters. And when you go to companies like this, everybody will tell you about them. This is in stark contrast to one consulting business I worked with recently. I had a very strange gig as a consultant to a consulting company. And they had done all the things that they should have done. You know, they got their product line in order, they got rid of all the dead wood, all that sort of thing. And now they were sitting down and saying, you know, the real thing we have to focus on now is our people. How do we get more out of our people? And they went on to say, you know, the great thing is that our engagement scores are up. Great, I said. From what to what? From 59 to 61%. Okay. Hmm. It's not great. <laughs> well, no, but it's the right trend, they said. Yeah, yeah, I can see it's the right trend. The thing is, it may just be it went up because all the people who hated working here were fired. Right? <laughs> So that may not be a sustainable trend that you've got there. There was this long silence. And they said, well, what do you think we should do? What do you think, how, do we, how do we find out if this is meaningful or not? And I let this silence hang in the room for as long as I possibly could, thinking somebody's going to get the answer here. Come on, somebody must know the answer. Silence. And so finally I said, I think you have to talk to people. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Hmm. I said, you know, what should we say to them? And I said, well, I think you should ask them, what's it like working here? When you get home at night, do you talk to your kids about what you did today? I mean, do you get home at night in time to talk to your kids? And are they interested? And are you interested? And are you proud? And are they proud? Because if none of that happens, I think you have a problem. Do they want their friends to work here? I'm not talking just net promoter scores. I'm talking, do they actually invest their, you know, their best relationships in this organization? Do they believe in what you're doing? Do they believe that it matters? Do they care? That's what the word engagement means. I mean, I know it's a buzzword now, but once upon a time, it meant did they really connect like gears engage and therefore push things forward? Well, I don't know how those conversations went, but I await the next data with some interest. As for my Green Berets, <laughs> They've been a really fascinating group to watch. They're almost all of them still friends, still in contact. I see them all on Facebook, all still talking to each other, all still working together. There's this really strange pattern that I've not started to notice, which is one of them gets a really good gig and discovers, actually, this is a really great place to work and we're doing really hard stuff and it's really scary and it's really exciting and it's super ambitious. And then they call over all their friends to come and work there. 
They kind of move in squadrons, these people, from company to company to company. And of course, when they do that, they bring fantastic acceleration to the work, because there's all that getting to know you stuff. They did that 20 years ago. And they just dig into the hard problems, and they have the time of their lives. Because that's their idea of fun. That's their idea of engagement. It's doing work that matters, with people that matter to them, in order to create lives that matter. Black lives, brown lives, white lives, female lives, male lives, young and old lives in a world where they think they really can and do make an impact. Thank you very much. <laughs>